In April 2020 General Conference, President Nelson said, We live in the day that our forefathers have awaited with anxious expectation. We have front row seats to witness live what the prophet Nephi saw only in vision, that the power of the Lamb of God would descend upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. You, my brothers and sisters, are among those men, women, and children whom Nephi saw. Think of that. President Nelson quoted one of the most dramatic and pivotal prophecies in Scripture, seen also by Daniel, John the Revelator, and many other prophets, and he identified us as the ones that will live to see it come to pass. This is the greatest prophecy I've heard any living prophet ever speak to a generation. And then he invited us to think of that. He quoted the part of Nephi's prophecy that describes how Zion will overcome as all the powers of the earth unite to fight against the saints of God. Nephi also saw other events and circumstances leading up to that point as we follow the prophet's invitation to think about and ponder this prophecy, we discover life-changing truths. We will witness the final stages of wickedness in our civilization. We will see the day when our survival depends on our spiritual capacity to perform miracles. We will see the Lord's prophet speak to the nations as Moses spoke to Pharaoh. As Gentile civilization crumbles, we will gather into the society that becomes the millennial kingdom of God. Starting in verse 13, it reads, And it came to pass that I beheld that the great mother of abominations did gather together multitudes upon the face of all the earth among all the nations of the Gentiles to fight against the Lamb of God. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth. And they were armed with righteousness, and with the power of God in great glory. And it came to pass that I beheld that the wrath of God was poured out upon that great and abominable church, insomuch that there were wars and rumors of wars among all the nations and kindreds of the earth. Knowing that we are among the men, women, and children that Nephi saw, we should better understand what we will witness live. The events we will investigate are fighting against the Lamb of God, the wrath of God poured out upon the Gentiles, and armed with righteousness. As we look deeper into each of these themes, it will clarify when and how they will come to pass and how we should respond. In verse 13, he talks about gathering together multitudes upon the face of the earth among all the nations of the Gentiles to fight against the Lamb of God. Well, what is meant by the word fight? In the same vision, the word fight is used to describe what happened to the twelve apostles. In chapter 11, verse 34, it reads, And after he was slain, referring to Jesus Christ and his crucifixion, I saw the multitudes of the earth that they were gathered together to fight against the apostles of the Lamb. Both John, the Revelator, and Daniel described this same event as making war with the saints. So this is not just a verbal argument. This is physical warfare and persecution. Modern prophets foretell of this. Robert D. Hales said, In recent decades, the Church has largely been spared the terrible misunderstandings and persecutions experienced by the early saints. It will not always be so. Russell M. Nielsen said, why do we need such resilient faith? Because difficult days are ahead. Rarely in the future will it be easy or popular to be a faithful Latter-day Saint. Each of us will be tested. The Apostle Paul warned that in the latter days those who diligently follow the Lord shall suffer persecution. 
that very persecution can either crush you into silent weakness or motivate you to become more exemplary and courageous in your daily lives. Recently, uh, Russell M. Nelson gave a devotional in Samoa, and this text comes from the Church News site who quoted partially what he said. This church, when restored in its fullness, will prepare the world for the coming of the Lord, but not before Christ's followers are persecuted, he said. Church members in the Samoan Islands will not be immune from being persecuted, he said, warning them to prepare to be persecuted even every day and telling them they have a solemn duty to prepare for it. In verse 15, Nephi said that he saw that the wrath of God was poured out upon that great and abominable church. So what is the wrath of God, and what brings it about? Moroni wrote in Ether chapter 2, And now we can behold the decrees of God concerning this land, that it is a land of promise, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall serve God, or they shall be swept off when the fullness of his wrath shall come upon them. And the fullness of his wrath cometh upon them when they are ripened in iniquity. And it is not until the fullness of iniquity among the children of the land that they are swept off. The wrath of God cleanses the wicked from the land. It comes only after a nation has ripened in iniquity, and no sooner. Although this decree is specific to America, the scriptures show that it is consistent with other lands and nations throughout history. So how do we know if a nation is ripened in iniquity? Amulek spoke in Ammonihah and said, Yea, I say unto you, that if it were not for the prayers of the righteous who are now in the land, that ye would even now be visited with utter destruction. But it is by the prayers of the righteous that ye are spared. Now therefore, if ye will cast out the righteous from among you, Then will not the Lord stay his hand, but in his fierce anger he will come out against you. Samuel the Lamanite spoke to the Nephites, But blessed are they who will repent, for them will I spare. But behold, if it were not for the righteous who are in this great city, behold, I would cause that fire should come down out of heaven to destroy it. But behold, it is for the righteous' sake that it is spared. But behold, the time cometh, saith the Lord, that when ye shall cast out the righteous from among you, then shall ye be ripe for destruction. When the wicked use physical aggression in casting out the righteous, this causes a geographical separation of the righteous from the wicked. Once the separation is complete, the wrath of God is poured out upon the wicked to their destruction. This seems to be the pattern for cleansing irreversibly corrupt societies. There is a consistent cause and effect relationship between the persecution of the righteous, the physical separation of the righteous from the wicked, which is when they're ripened in iniquity, and then the wrath of God being poured out upon the wicked. This pattern has repeated itself again and again throughout history. We will look at a few historical examples of the wrath of God to give us a clearer picture of what will occur in our day. After Jesus was crucified and darkness was over the land in America, Jesus spoke to the Nephites and he said, The city of Kishkumen have I caused to be burned with fire, and the inhabitants thereof, because of their wickedness, in casting out the prophets and stoning those whom I did send to declare unto them concerning their wickedness and their abominations. And because they did cast them all out, that there were none righteous among them, I did send down fire and destroy them. O all ye that are spared, because ye were more righteous than they. Mormon, commenting on the destruction, said, And it was the more righteous part of the people who were saved. And it was they who received the prophets and stoned them not. And it was they who had not shed the blood of the saints who were spared. So we can see there's an extreme polarization here. Either they're murderous against the righteous or they're cast out. 
similar in Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. You know the story. Abraham bargains with the Lord about saving the city for the sake of 50 righteous people. And the Lord says, if you can find 50 righteous people, I'll spare them. And then Abraham goes back and forth, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. And the Lord finally says, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. As we read the story, we find out that the only righteous people found were Lot and his family. At this point, the people of the city were aggressing against Lot and his family. Despite his family's reluctance, the angels grabbed them by the arm to get them out of the city and spare their lives. And right after they left, that's when the city was destroyed. Prior to the flood, in the time of Enoch, a similar thing occurred. It says, And so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God, and their enemies came to battle against them. And all nations feared greatly, so powerful was the word of Enoch. And lo, Zion, in process of time, was taken up into heaven. And Enoch beheld angels descending out of heaven, bearing testimony of the Father and Son. And the Holy Ghost fell on many, and they were caught up by the powers of heaven into Zion. So prior to the flood, those who weren't ripened in iniquity were translated, leaving only those who were ripe in iniquity, excepting the eight who boarded the ark. In Genesis 15, the Lord covenants with Abraham, and he promises him the territory that he'll give to him and his children. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Now, this is referring to Abraham's posterity being in Egypt for four hundred years. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again meaning returning to this promised land of Canaan. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So the Lord wouldn't let the children of Abraham dispossess the Amorites until the Amorites were ripened in iniquity, and that wasn't going to be until 400 years later. Nephi, speaking of Joshua's conquest of the land of Canaan, he said to his brothers, Do you suppose that our fathers, the Israelites, would have been more choice than the Canaanites if they had been righteous? I say unto you, Nay. But behold, the Canaanites had rejected every word of God, and they were ripe in iniquity, and the fullness of the wrath of God was upon them. These scriptures show that God is consistent, and his laws for individuals and nations do not change. In order for the wrath of God to come upon the Gentiles, as Nephi saw, the Gentiles must first become ripened in iniquity. We will witness this same pattern in our day. Persecution, physical separation, ripened in iniquity, and then the wrath of God. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, a study of history is a study of prophecy. Apart from casting out the righteous, there are other scriptural patterns that will help us measure how close our civilization is to being ripened in iniquity. Gary E. Stevenson said, Satan has spent millennia calculating and practicing the ability to persuade God's children to believe that good is evil and evil is good. Consider that Satan and his followers have played an active role in every civilization that has ripened in iniquity. Every single one that we just read about, those same beings are active right now. <clears throat> They've been perfecting the formula to corrupt a society and lead to its demise. And they are working to destroy our civilization as well. What is their formula for corrupting nations? What can consistently cause entire societies to fall apart? The answer, breaking down the foundation of society. Family is the first and most basic form of society. The family proclamation states, God has commanded that the sacred powers of procreation are to be employed only between man and woman lawfully wedded as husband and wife. We declare the means by which mortal life is created to be divinely appointed. The sustainability of society depends upon the proper use of the procreative powers. Therefore, in order to destroy society, Satan and his followers seek to destroy the family unit by creating a culture 
that distorts and abuses the procreative powers. After the children of Israel entered the Promised Land, the Lord warned them of four sins that led the Canaanites to destruction. Notice the order of these four groups of sins and how they all relate to the abuse of the procreative powers and the dis disintegration of the family unit. In Leviticus 18, the Lord says, After the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. And then verses 6 through 20 list various forms of fornication, incest, and adultery, which all can be categorized as violations of the law of chastity. So that was the first group. And then continuing in verse 21, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Molech was a Canaanite idol. Several scriptures indicate that infants and children were sacrificed by fire to this idol. And that's what's meant by letting thy seed, thy children, pass through the fire. Uh, we will label this sin as child sacrifice. And then in verse 22, the next verse, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. This refers to homosexuality. The next verse, 23, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. This refers to bestiality. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. So the Lord warns the Israelites that if they follow the same pattern as the Canaanites, they too will be cast out of the land. In 2 Kings 21, we read that Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Manasseh was one of the last of the kings of Judah. Um, so he seduced the children of Israel to do worse than the Canaanites. Verse 11, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations and, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And the Lord did. He cleansed the land by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. This same thing happened to the northern kingdom earlier. This is explaining the reasons for the Assyrian captivity. 2 Kings 17, For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God and walked in the statutes of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. So for the same reason, the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed and taken captive by the Assyrians. And it specifically mentions that both Manasseh and the, of the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom committed the same abominations and whoredoms that the Canaanites had done, which would include these four, these four sins. This same sequence seems to be repeating in our civilization as well. Neil L. Anderson observed, During my teenage and early married years, many in the world walked away from the Lord's standard we call the law of chastity that sexual relations are to occur only between a man and a woman who are lawfully married. In my twenties and thirties, many walked away from the sacred protection of the unborn as abortion became more acceptable. In more recent years, many have walked away from God's law that marriage is a sacred union between a man and a woman. So, he observed the same order of sins being accepted in our society. First, the law of chastity, then child sacrifice or abortion, third, homosexuality. If the pattern continues, then we can expect that the final stage of our ripening society will tolerate, accept, legally protect, embrace, and even celebrate bestiality. When a culture condones the abuse and distortion of the procreative powers that God has ordained for the creation of families, it disintegrates the family unit in that society. The legal status of these four stages of corruption is also an indicator of the society at large. 
This is Mosiah speaking regarding their new republic. He says, Now it is not common that the voice of the people desireth anything contrary to that which is right, but it is common for the lesser part of the people to desire that which is not right. Therefore, this shall ye observe, and make it your law, to do your business by the voice of the people. And if the time comes that the voice of the people doth choose iniquity, then is the time that the judgments of God will come upon you. Yea, then is the time he will visit you with great destruction. Mormon later commenting on the state of the Republic, he said, As their laws and their governments were established by the voice of the people, they who chose evil were more numerous than they who chose good. Therefore, they were ripening for destruction, for the laws had become corrupted. Laws are already being passed that are setting the stage for this. To give an example, here is an excerpt from a rule that the Utah State Board of Education passed on August 5, 2021. It reads, Professional learning may not include instruction that promotes or endorses that a student or educator's sexual orientation determines the content of the student or educator's character, including the student or educator's values, morals, or personal ethics. So this rule makes it illegal to teach that sexual orientation is related to values, morals, or ethics. If a student or educator states that they have a sexual orientation of pedophilia or that they practiced bestiality, it would be considered discrimination and non-inclusive to teach that it is immoral. Rather, it would be met with the professional learning shall include instruction in acknowledging differences and showing due regard for feelings, rights, cultures, and traditions, acknowledging diverse values and lived experiences, implementing principles and strategies of inclusion as they pertain to students and educators with diverse abilities and backgrounds, while outlawing the teaching of morals regarding sexual orientation it legally protects and promotes inclusivity of every imaginable lifestyle. It is through broad and vague legislation like this that the next wave of the sexual revolution will be protected and promoted in the name of inclusion and anti-discrimination. This is just one example of how the stage is being set for the final phase of iniquity. After warning the children of Israel, the Lord said, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. So the Lord is describing that the earth itself responds to the iniquity of the people on the land. In Moses chapter 7, Enoch looked upon the earth, and he heard a voice from the bowels thereof, saying, Woe, woe is me, the mother of men! I am pained, I am weary, because of the wickedness of my children. When shall I rest, and be cleansed from the filthiness which has gone forth out of me? The earth itself responds when societies become ripened in iniquity. The destruction of the wicked cleanses the land. Children born into these societies would have no way of choosing between good and evil because they would only be presented with evil. To prevent the pure spirits of the Father from entering these societies, the Lord revokes their procreative powers by taking away their bodies and sending them to the spirit world. The wrath of God is a merciful way to cleanse societies so the earth may continue to be a place for his children to learn and grow. Prior to the wrath of God, we see another pattern that God always warns through his prophets. Nephi said, And as one generation hath been destroyed among the Jews because of iniquity, even so have they been destroyed from generation to generation according to their iniquities. And never hath any of them been destroyed, save it were foretold them by the prophets of the Lord. As the Gentile culture approaches the fullness of iniquity, the true prophets of God will continue to warn of the unsustainable course of society and the wrath of God to be poured out. 
The family proclamation states, We warn that the disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. Well, now that we've seen how true prophets will continue to respond as the earth and our civilization ripens in iniquities, and in part one we've seen how false prophets act, we can compare the two. The false prophets of the world call for obedience to the collectivist ideology of global sustainability, a plan of safety for all that excludes God and his commandments. They threaten that disobedience will destroy our entire planet. The true prophets of God call for obedience to God's laws to avoid the decay and demise of society. The world's plan of salvation rejects God's plan of salvation. Elder Christofferson compared the urgency of God's plan of salvation versus the world's plan of sustainable development. D. Todd Christofferson stated, In 2015, the United Nations adopted what was called the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It was described as a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. He then mentions some of the goals of this plan, citing the United Nations website where you can read all 17 goals. He continues, The concept of sustainable development is an interesting and important one. Even more urgent, however, is the broader question of sustainable societies. Urgent is the word he uses to contrast these two concepts. What are the most urgent parts of the 2030 Agenda that we can compare to? Well, let's follow his citation and find out. It takes us to the United Nations website and we see all of these goals, 1 through 17. And the only one that has urgency in them is goal number 13, climate action. Take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. At the bottom it says, climate change continues to exacerbate the frequency and severity of natural disasters. Massive wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, floods. Reading more from the 2030 Agenda, it says, Climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time. The survival of many societies is at risk. We are determined to address decisively the threat posed by climate change. The global nature of climate change calls for the widest possible international cooperation. Goal 1.5, reduce their exposure and vulnerability to climate-related extreme events and environmental shocks and disasters. We can be the first generation to succeed in ending poverty just as we may be the last to have a chance of saving the planet. That's just a sample of the doomsday rhetoric and crisis forecasting found in the blueprint that highlight the urgency of sustainable development. And what did Elder Christofferson say about all of this urgency? Even more urgent, however, is the broader question of sustainable societies. He then refers to the Zion societies of Enoch and the Nephites as models for us. He continues, the societies in these two examples were sustained by the blessings of heaven. A society in which individual consent is the only constraint on sexual activity is a society in decay. Adultery, promiscuity, out-of-wedlock births, and elective abortions are but some of the bitter fruits that grow out of the ongoing sexual revolution. The creator of this planet has made it clear that the consequences of moral decay are far more urgent to address than the threat of ozone decay. The true prophets of God invite us to keep God's commandments. The false prophets of the world seek and preach salvation without God, using fear to cause people to trust in the arm of the flesh. Those who follow the direction of the true prophets of God will develop into a culture marked by trust in God, families, peace, virtue, and holiness. Those who follow the panic of the false prophets of the world will develop into a culture marked by hysteria, loneliness, despair, and hedonism. The ripening of iniquity adds a moral and cultural component to the polarization of society. 
the ideology of the Church of the Devil rejects the three most essential parts of the Father's plan. Jesus Christ, the Creator and Savior, freedom to choose, and the family. The ideological division develops and matures into a cultural division. More and more righteous families are awakening to the dangers of remaining attached to the decaying culture of Babylon. To spiritually protect ourselves and our children, we need to throw off the traditions that bind us to Babylon. The righteous will feel an, an increasing need to gather for spiritual and emotional strength as they fit in less with the norms of society. We must strive to build a Christ-centered culture of Zion. William K. Jackson said, It may seem that culture is so heavily embedded in our thinking and behavior that it is impossible to change. It is, after all, much of what we feel defines us and from which we feel a sense of identity. It can be such a strong influence that we can fail to see the man-made weaknesses or flaws in our own cultures, resulting in a reluctance to throw off some of the traditions of our fathers. An overfixation on one's cultural identity may lead to the rejection of worthwhile, even godly ideas, attributes, and behaviors. In addition to the cultural division that will come from ripening in iniquity, there are other prophecies that we will witness before the wrath of God is poured out upon the Gentiles. The final testimony to the Gentiles. In section 88 of Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord says, Behold, I will hasten my work in its time. Therefore tarry ye and labor diligently, that you may be perfected in your ministry to go forth among the Gentiles for the last time, as many as the mouth of the Lord shall name, to bind up the law and seal up the testimony, and to prepare the saints for the hour of judgment which is to come, that their souls may escape the wrath of God, the desolation of abomination which awaits the wicked both in this world and in the world to come. And after your testimony cometh wrath and indignation upon the people. For after your testimony cometh the testimony of earthquakes that shall cause groanings in the midst of her, and men shall fall upon the ground and shall not be able to stand. And also cometh the testimony of the voice of thunderings and the voice of lightnings and the voice of tempests and the voice of the waves of the sea heaving themselves beyond their bounds. After the final testimony to the Gentiles, nature will testify, or in other words, the wrath of God will come. The earth responds to iniquity. This is the only verse in all of Scripture where the Lord himself mentions the hastening of his work, and it refers to the missionary work among the Gentiles for the last time. So when will this hastened final period of missionary work begin? It already has. It began in 2013 with the lowering of the age of missionaries. S. Gifford Nilsson said, All over the world, stakes, districts, and missions are experiencing a new level of energy as the Savior's declaration to Joseph Smith in 1832 is being fulfilled. Behold, I will hasten my work in its time. Brothers and sisters, that time is now. L. Tom Perry said, This is the most remarkable era in the history of the church. This is something that ranks with the great events that have happened in past history, like the first vision, like the gift of the Book of Mormon, like the restoration of the gospel, like all of the things that build that foundation for us to go forward and teach in our Father in Heaven's kingdom. And he was talking about the lowering of the age of missionaries. The final testimony to the Gentiles will culminate with the Lord's servant speaking to the nations, giving the final ultimatum that determines their fate, the rejection of which will seal their destruction. Jesus prophesied to the Nephites in 3 Nephi chapter 21. He said, But behold, the life of my servant shall be in my hand. Therefore it shall come to pass that whosoever will not believe in my words, who am Jesus Christ, which the Father shall cause him to bring forth unto the Gentiles, they shall be cut off from among my people who are of the covenant. And I will execute vengeance and fury upon them, even as upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. So the Lord's servant 
in the latter days will deliver the words of Christ to the Gentiles. If they believe his words and repent, they will be gathered with the covenant people. If not, they will be cut off from them. In section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord says, And the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. Um, this, in an article attributed to John Taylor, he says, Now just at this time, God will come out of his hiding place and vex the nations in his hot displeasure. By the mouth of his prophet, he will rebuke strong nations afar off, notwithstanding their strong armies and great miracles and cunning arts. His servant, the prophet in Zion, will have a marvelous boldness to rebuke them and to lay down before them in plainness and inflexible firmness the law of the Lord, as Moses laid down the law to Pharaoh, and then continued to multiply evils and judgments until he made an utter end of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Even so will the living God prescribe the line of conduct to be pursued and the penalties of violation to great and mighty nations until they rally around the ensign established upon the mountains and go up to the house of the God of Jacob to learn his ways or are utterly overwhelmed in keen anguish and ruin. Another pattern in the scriptures of what will happen with the Lord's latter-day servant comes from Moses. In Exodus chapter 12, Verse 37, it reads, And the children of Israel journeyed, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children, and a mixed multitude went up also with them. So a multitude of people who were not of the covenant chose to follow the prophet, to flee from Egypt and gather with the people of God. The Lord made bare his arm, or revealed his power, to the nation of Egypt. In the latter days, the Lord will make bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations. As with Egypt, the Lord will do it through his covenant people, who Nephi saw were scattered upon the face of the earth. Before the wrath of God is poured out upon the Gentiles, as Nephi saw, we will witness the following. Our culture will ripen in iniquity, likely through the four stages of corruption mentioned in Leviticus 18 moral and cultural polarization between the two churches, increasing perse persecution towards those of the Church of the Lamb, the last missionary efforts to the Gentiles, an ultimatum to the nations by the Lord's servant, and the final opportunity to gather with the covenant people or be cut off. The final point. What does it mean to be armed with righteousness? In part one, we already identified those who align with the church of the devil and those who align with the church of the Lamb. Here, it mentions another group. It says that the power of the Lamb of God would descend upon the saints of the church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord. So who are these covenant people that Nephi sees? Nephi explained in 2 Nephi chapter 30, as many of the Gentiles as will repent are the covenant people of the Lord, and as many of the Jews as will not repent shall be cast off. For the Lord covenant with none, save it be with them that repent and believe in his Son, who is the Holy One of Israel. The covenant people are those who repent and enter into covenants with the Lord. Just as the mixed multitude walked safely through the Red Sea by gathering with God's covenant people, Similarly, all who choose to align with the Church of the Lamb will find safety by gathering with the covenant people. What is meant by the word armed? The word fight refers to physical aggression, warfare, battle, and combat. Therefore, the wicked Gentiles will be armed with physical weapons and instruments of war. To overcome this, the righteous will need physical protection from a greater power. There is only one other scripture that refers to being armed with the power of God, and it tells us how to do it. Doctrine and Covenants, section 109. This is Joseph Smith's inspired dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple. It reads in verse 22, We ask thee, Holy Father, that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power 
and that thy name may be upon them, and thy glory be round about them, and thine angels have charge over them. It's through the ordinances of the temple that the covenant people will be armed with the power of God. Of all the verses in Nephi's vision that we will live through, why did President Nelson choose this one to be the focus? In his first message as president, he said, As a new presidency, we want to begin with the end in mind. The end for which each of us strives is to be endowed with power in the house of the Lord. As we witness the final stages of a decaying society, it is the endowment of power that we should consistently have in our minds as our protection. Just as the scriptures have examples of societies being ripened in iniquity, there are also examples of societies being armed with righteousness, which will give us a clearer picture of what must occur in our day. Dieter F. Uchtdorf said, Every dispensation has, face, has faced its times of trial and hardship. Enoch and his people lived in a time of wickedness, wars, and bloodshed. But the Lord came and dwelt with his people. He had something unimaginable in mind for them. He helped them establish Zion, a people of one heart and one mind who dwelt in righteousness. God has something unimaginable in mind for you personally and the church collectively, a marvelous work and a wonder. In Moses chapter 7, we read about what happened to Enoch and his people. So great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God, and their enemies came to battle against them. So there was persecution. This would have led to division between the righteous and the wicked. And he spake the word of the Lord, and the earth trembled, and the mountains fled, even according to his command. And the rivers of water were turned out of their course, and the roar of the lions was heard out of the wilderness. And all nations feared greatly, so powerful was the word of Enoch, and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. There also came up a land out of the depth of the sea, and so great was the fear of the enemies of the people of God that they fled and stood afar off and went upon the land which came up out of the depth of the sea. And the giants of the land also stood afar off, and there went forth a curse upon all people that fought against God. And from that time forth there were wars and bloodshed among them. But the Lord came and dwelt with his people, and they dwelt in righteousness. So imagine, the earth is filled with violence, wars, and bloodshed outside of Zion, but inside of Zion, it's a glorious place where Jesus Christ himself is, is walking among them and dwelling with them. That same pattern is going to happen in our day. Jesus is going to reign among us while there is still chaos outside of Zion. Verse 17, The fear of the Lord was upon all nations. So great was the glory of the Lord, which was upon his people. And the Lord blessed the land, and they were blessed upon the mountains and upon the high places, and did flourish. Melchizedek and his people also obtained this, this degree of power. For God, having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself that every one being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of God, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and this by the will of the Son of God, which was from before the foundation of the world. The Nephites obtained this. Jacob wrote, Wherefore, we search the prophets, and we have many revelations in the spirit of prophecy. And having all these witnesses, we obtain a hope, and our faith becometh unshaken, insomuch that we truly can command in the name of Jesus, and the very trees obey us, or the mountains or the waves of the sea. Doctrine and Covenant section 103, the Lord prophesies of how Zion will be redeemed. Verse 15, he says, Behold, I say unto you, the redemption of Zion must needs come by power. Therefore, I will raise up unto my people a man who shall lead them like as Moses led the children of Israel. 
for ye are the children of Israel, and of the seed of Abraham, and ye must needs be led out of bondage by power, and with a stretched out arm. And as your fathers were led at the first, even so shall the redemption of Zion of Zion be. Therefore let not your hearts faint, for I say not unto you as I said unto your fathers, mine angels shall go up before you, but not my presence. But I say unto you, mine angels shall go up before you, and also my presence, and in time ye shall possess the goodly land. Imagine the marvel and wonder felt by the Egyptians, the mixed multitude, and the children of Israel. Imagine how the news spread like wildfire through the nearby nations. Now, instead of one isolated event in one nation, imagine that multiplied all over the world where temples dot the earth as the power of the Lamb descends upon groups and communities that are scattered upon all the face of the earth. As marvelous as the days of Enoch, Melchizedek, and Moses were, they all awaited with anxious expectation for the day that you and I would live to see. In part one, we reveal the tactics that will be used to deceive the nations, enabling us to awaken to our awful situation. It's as if we're all asleep living in a dream until we open our eyes and awaken to the reality around us. Or as Paul said, we believe a lie, a strong delusion, until we are awakened. Those who are sleeping aren't aware of what's going on and are incapable of reacting. As in a dream, everything's confusing and nothing really makes sense. While the awake are reacting to what the devil has done, the devil's already planning to release his next scheme. We need to be more than awake. We need to see beyond what's happening in the present and proactively prepare for what will come. The Lord's wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil, and his prophet is always several steps ahead of the devil. As we follow his counsel, we will be able to take steps now that will enable us to avoid the snares and traps of the devil and eventually triumph. President Nielsen has been preparing us and continues to prepare us. Consider the teachings of President Nelson for the past six years. Some of the most common themes have been covenants, power, temple, and priesthood. Exactly what Nephi saw. There's no way we're going to be able to overcome this by relying on the arm of the flesh. It will only be possible by the endowment of power from God. President Nelson said, I fear, brethren, that some among us may one day wake up and realize what power in the priesthood really is, and face the deep regret that they spent far more time seeking power over others or power at work than learning to exercise fully the power of God. I urgently plead with each one of us to live up to our privileges as bearers of the priesthood. In a coming day, only those men who have taken their priesthood seriously by diligently seeking to be taught by the Lord himself will be able to bless, guide, protect, strengthen, and heal others. Only a man who has paid the price for priesthood power will be able to bring miracles to those he loves and keep his marriage and family safe now and throughout eternity. In these latter days, we know there will be earthquakes in diverse places. Perhaps one of those diverse places will be in our own homes, where emotional, financial, or spiritual earthquakes may occur. Priesthood power can calm the seas and heal fractures in the earth. Priesthood power can also calm the minds and heal fractures in the hearts of those we love. He said, Daily immersion in the Word of God is crucial for spiritual survival especially in these days of increasing upheaval. As we feast on the words of Christ daily, the words of Christ will tell us how to respond to difficulties we never thought we would face. We can also hear him in the temple. The house of the Lord is a house of learning. There the Lord teaches in his own way. There each ordinance teaches about the Savior. There we learn how to part the veil and communicate more clearly with heaven. There we learn how to rebuke the adversary 
and draw upon the Lord's priesthood power to strengthen us and those we love. How eager each of us should be to seek refuge there. I renew my plea for you to do whatever it takes to increase your spiritual capacity to receive personal revelation. Doing so will help you know how to move ahead with your life, what to do during times of crisis, and how to discern and avoid the temptations and the deceptions of the adversary. What will happen is you more intentionally hear, hearken, and heed what the Savior has said and what he is saying now through his prophets. I promise that you will be blessed with additional power to deal with temptation, struggles, and weakness. I promise miracles in your marriage, family relationships, and daily work. I promise that your capacity to feel joy will increase, even if turbulence increases in your life. So reviewing, those who belong to the church of the devil will ripen in iniquity as they embrace abominations that disintegrate the family unit. This adds a moral and cultural component to the polarization of society. The church of the devil will ultimately reject the three most essential parts of the Father's plan. Jesus Christ, the Creator and Savior, freedom to choose, and the family. As this polarization intensifies, persecution will increase, resulting in a geographical separation of the wicked from the righteous. The righteous will need to gather to places of refuge and safety. These communities will dot the globe. Through faith in Jesus Christ and by power in the priesthood enabled through temple ordinances, the covenant people of the Lord and those gathered with them will be armed with the power of God in great glory. The arm of the Lord will be revealed to all nations as mighty miracles and great wonders are performed like those in the days of Enoch, Melchizedek, and Moses. The Lord's servant will speak to the nations and offer a final invitation for repentance and salvation. Those who reject his words will be cut off from the Lord's people. Those who believe will gather with them. After the final testimony is sealed, the wrath of God will be poured out upon the Gentiles. The period between the persecution and the endowment of power could be described as a time of travail and pain for the righteous. It is in this period that the political kingdom of God will be born. Remember, Nephi and John had the same vision. And John saw the war in heaven. In chapter 12, the Joseph Smith translation, it says, he saw a great sign in heaven in the likeness of things on the earth. So his vision of the war in heaven is similar to what will happen on the earth. And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman, which was the church of God, who had been delivered of her pains and brought forth the kingdom of our God and his Christ. And the woman, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. The rod of iron represents the word of God. So what is this kingdom that will be born of the church and that will rule all nations with the word of God? And all of this in the context of the war that's taking place. Doctrine and Covenants 101, section 101, the Lord says, The laws and constitution of the people should be maintained for the rights and protection of all flesh. And for this purpose have I established the constitution of this land. George Q. Cannon said, A man may belong to the kingdom of God and yet not be a member of the church of God, because God is the father of the Latter-day Saints as well as every human being. When he establishes his kingdom, it will protect all in their equal rights. That is the kind of, kind of kingdom we have to contend for. That is the kind of kingdom we have to establish. And it is already provided for in the constitution given unto us by God. There is no liberty that a human being can desire, neither is there a right that can be exercised properly that we do not have under the constitution of our land. It is broad enough if interpreted in its true spirit, to cover the individual, the continent, and the entire globe, and furnish freedom for all. 
Joseph Fielding Smith said, The framers of the Constitution were men inspired to make this document as near to the fundamental doctrines of the kingdom of God as it was possible under the circumstances for it to be. Brigham Young said, The kingdom of God will be extended over the earth. Even now, the form of government of the United States differs but little from that of the kingdom of God. When the day comes in which the kingdom of God will bear rule, the flag of the United States will proudly flutter unsullied on the flagstaff of liberty and equal rights. The United States Constitution is integral to the establishment of the political kingdom of God. The political kingdom of God will be born in a period of travail and pain. Travail means painful, laborious effort. As a child is nourished in the womb of the mother until the appointed time, similarly, the kingdom of God grows in embryo and will be born out of the church through painful, laborious effort. Brigham Young said, This kingdom, which was only in embryo, would soon send forth its influence throughout the nations. There will no doubt be a regular organization. That kingdom grows out of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it is not the Church. For a man may be a legislator in that body, which will issue laws to sustain the inhabitants of the earth in their individual rights and still not belong to the Church of Jesus Christ at all. So both the Church of God and the Kingdom of God will be directed by the Lord through his prophet until he comes to reign personally. However, they are not the same institution. Ezra Taft Benson said, I have faith that the Constitution will be saved, as prophesied by Joseph Smith, but it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by the citizens of this nation who love and cherish freedom. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church, men and women who will subscribe to and abide by the principles of the Constitution. Orson Pratt said, We shall be obliged to have a government to preserve ourselves in unity and peace, for they, through being wasted away, will not have power to govern, for state will be divided against state, city against city, town against town, and the whole country will be in terror and confusion. Mobocracy will prevail, and there will be no security throughout this great republic for the lives or property of the people. When that time shall arrive... We shall necessarily want to carry out the principles of our great Constitution. From these statements, we learn that the Constitution will be saved at a more local level when the current system of government is failing to maintain order. It is during this period of painful, laborious effort that the Constitution must be saved, giving birth to God's millennial political kingdom. Benjamin F. Johnson, referring to Joseph Smith, said, And he, Joseph Smith, taught us relating to the kingdom of God, as it would become organized upon the earth through all adopting the God-given constitution of the United States as a palladium of liberty and equal rights. Recently, Dallin H. Oaks said, Our belief in divine inspiration gives Latter-day Saints a unique responsibility to uphold and defend the United States Constitution and principles of constitutionalism wherever we live. Joseph Smith prophesied, Even this nation will be on the, ver on the very verge of crumbling to pieces and tumbling to the ground, and when the Constitution is upon the brink of ruin, this people will be the staff upon which the nation shall lean and they shall bear away the Constitution away from the very verge of destruction. Then shall the Lord say, Go tell all my servants who are the strength of mine house, my young men and middle-aged, come to the land of my vineyard and fight the battle of the Lord. Then the kings and queens shall come, then the rulers of the earth shall come, then shall all saints come, yea, the foreign saints shall come to fight for the land of my vineyard. For in this thing shall be their safety, and they will have no power to choose, but will come as a man fleeth from a sudden destruction. So we can see that the Lord's prophet will give the ultimatum and call people to the land of Zion. Because the only alternative is destruction. 
Through his prophet, the Lord will then call the righteous who are armed with power and are scattered upon the face of the earth to come to America, the land of Zion. It is important that the saints build Zion in their homelands until this point. It will be through his covenant people that are scattered across the earth that the Lord will reveal his arm in the eyes of all nations, thereby blessing all the kindreds of the earth. The only safety that we have is in keeping our covenants, no matter where we live. We will live through a period of great transition. As one culture embraces abominations, another will seek holiness. As the power of the devil is made manifest, the power of the Lamb is waiting to burst forth. As one civilization is wiped away, another will emerge. As the kingdom of the devil shakes and tumbles, the kingdom of God will be born. This world is revolving through the dark of night into the millennial day. You and I were born to participate in the greatest revolution of light that has ever occurred on this earth. We were foreordained to be on the earth at this time, not merely to survive through it, but to be leaders and gatherers into the society that is to emerge, leading through the transition into the millennium, preparing the world for the second coming of Christ. We can prepare for the kingdom of God by gathering others to support and defend the Constitution. And we can establish Zion by gathering others to Jesus Christ and his only true and living church. As we diligently seek to be taught by the Lord himself and learn to exercise fully the power of God, we will become kings and queens unto the Most High God, those kings and queens of the Gentiles that will be nursing fathers and nursing mothers to gather the remaining scattered of Israel, to bring them in our arms and carry them on our shoulders, bring them out of captivity unto freedom and out of darkness into light, and be saviors on Mount Zion. Amen.